In this video I will show you what a pull-up resistor is and how you can use it to connect a push button to the Arduino. We will look at the equations behind the concept, try out different resistor values in an example circuit and we will look at what happens if you decide not to use a pull-up resistor, which is frankly not a good idea because it can potentially cause damage to your circuits. And finally we will complete the traffic light project we have developed in the last videos by integrating a push button and completing the Arduino code. My name is Andreas from the Fearless Engineer and here we go. In the last video we have created two flashing LEDs by connecting them to the digital output pins of the Arduino board. And if you have seen the video you might remember that the idea of this traffic light project is to have pedestrians press a button, wait for some time and when the light changes from red to green it signals that it is safe to cross the street. And in this video we want to finish this project finally by accomplishing two things. First we hook up a push button to a digital input pin of the Arduino board and we see how we can use it to trigger a stable high and low signal. And secondly we complete the Arduino code for all phases of the traffic light cycle and now we start with connecting the button first. Let's go! Now in order to understand why we might need such a thing as a pull-up resistor, let's imagine a circuit where the input pin of a microcontroller is used to differentiate between the states high and low in order to trigger some kind of action. In most cases high means a voltage level of plus 5 volts and low means 0 volts. And in the circuit you can see here one of the Arduino input pins has been connected to the 5 volt supply and to a switch which is currently in an open position. And when you look at the current flow between 5 volts and the pin you can see that at least in the simulation here there is no current flowing into the Arduino which is the case because the input pins all have a very large resistance to prevent damage to the board and to the microcontroller. Let's now query the pin state and output the information to the serial monitor. And as you can see from the code, we first set the pin to which the switch is connected to input and then we store its current state into a global variable and then we initialize the serial monitor. And in case you're not familiar with the commands or the components we are using here, you might want to look at my video on Arduino programming and the Arduino IDE and the link is coming up for you right now. Now in the loop function we continuously read the pin state and only print it to the console in case it has changed its value, which is what happens in the if statement. We do this because we want to observe changes on the console and if we printed the state with each pin cycle the console would be filled up completely with high speed output and we would probably lose small and sudden changes to the pin state. And if we now run the circuit simulation you can see that the button state is indeed at high which is indicated by the single one which is printed to the console. Now what do you think will happen when we flip the switch here? You might want to ponder this question for a moment and pause the video to think about it. See you in a short while. Okay, so let's take a look at the circuit again. What we want is a low state at the input pin when the switch is closed. So let's close it now and see what happens. And as you can see, not all is well, to put it mildly. First, let's take a look at the current flow to investigate what's happening here. And as you can see, the switch has basically shorted the plus 5 volts with a ground connection which causes a huge current to flow through the switch. If we had built the circuit in reality and not in simulation, uh, we would have caused real damage to the parts of the circuit. So let's insert another resistor into the circuit directly above the node to the input pin. And let's start with 100 ohms. And as you can see here, the overall situation of the circuit has greatly improved after inserting this resistor here. The pin potential has changed to roughly 5 millivolts, which is close to zero, and the current has gone down to 50 milliamps only. And when we open the switch, the potential goes up to 5 volts again. So basically, we're almost good, or aren't we? Well. Not so much, because even though 5 millivolts is almost zero and 50 milliamps is low compared to the several amps we have seen before, it still seems pretty unnecessary to me to waste 50 milliamps on changing a simple pin state. And if you really had built the circuit in reality, it would drain your battery pretty quickly. So let's increase the resistance of R1 and set it to 10 kilo ohms instead. And as you can see, the voltage at the pin has dropped to almost zero and the current between plus 5 volts and ground is completely negligible in this case. And when we open the switch, you can see that the voltage level is pulled up to 5 volts again, just as it's supposed to be, which is why R1 is also called a pull-up resistor because it pulls up to a certain level which is present above the resistor. So a pull-up resistor makes sure that we get a stable potential at a certain position in the circuit without causing a current flow due to its high resistance value. 
Now let's take a look at the loop equation to find out why and how pull up resistors work and how we can find an appropriate resistance value for them. And in case you're not familiar with Kirchhoff's second law and the concept of loops and loop equations, you might want to watch the video on this topic first. The link is coming up for you right now. So what we need to do is sum up the voltages on the path between plus 5 volts and ground, which gives us the loop equation source voltage minus voltage drop at, across the resistor minus voltage drop across the switch equals zero. And note that we are now neglecting the resistance values of the wires in this case to keep it less crowded in the equation, but you can easily imagine these to be a part of R1 and the switch resistance. And in order to find the potential at the input pin, what we need to do is we need to solve the loop equation for the voltage across the switch, because voltage is defined as the potential difference between two points, and for the switch, the upper point is the potential at the pin, which we are looking for, and the lower point is the potential at ground, which is zero, which makes it very easy to uh, see that, the, that we get the potential at the pin by solving the equation. So if we look at the equation, we can easily see that we get the full five volts to drop across the switch when we can bring down the voltage drop across R1 to as close to zero as possible. And we can get the switch voltage to zero when the resistor voltage is at five volts. So in order to find out which values of R1 and R switch can lead us to this behavior, we need to make use of the concept of the voltage divider. And if you're not sure about how voltage dividers work, you might want to watch my video about this topic before you continue here. The link is also coming up for you right now at the top. And in case you're familiar, let's look at the equation and it tells us that the voltage across the switch equals the source voltage times the switch resistance divided by the total resistance of the loop. Now let's look at some examples to understand how this circuit behaves. And first we assume that R1 has a low resistance around 10 ohms and the switch is in an open position, which basically means that it has an almost infinite resistance. So from the equation, what we get is the voltage drop across the switch equals five volts times almost infinity divided by almost infinity plus 10 ohms, which is if you compare almost infinity to 10 ohms equals five volts. And when we now use a very large resistance for R1, let's say 10 mega ohms, what we get is the voltage drop across the switch equals five volts times almost infinity divided by almost infinity plus 10 mega ohms, which is not five volts as before because the resistance value of an open switch is not infinite in practice, but somewhere in the range of around 100 mega ohms. So you can see from this equation that if you insert the values, the potential at the switch will not be at five volts as before, but only at around 4.5 volts in this case, which will probably still be enough to detect the high state, but it's a totally unnecessary gamble. So in order to get as close to five volts as possible at the pin, we need our one to be large enough to sufficiently limit the current flow and at the same time small enough to cause the bulk of the voltage to drop across the switch. And in practice, you will find that most pull-up resistors are in the area of around 10 kilo ohms, which brings down the current flow to below one milliamp, which is acceptable and produces a stable high state at the same time. And now let's actually connect a real push button to our traffic light circuit. And to do so, we first insert the button into the breadboard and connect it to the ground pin of the Arduino using a wire. And then we insert a 10K resistor to the other side of the button and connect it to the plus five volt supply. And now we can use a wire to connect one of the contacts in between the resistor and the button to an input pin, which will now be either high or low, depending on the button state. And with this, we are basically done with the hardware part of the circuit. And let's now change the code from the last video so it can read the button state and control the LEDs accordingly. And first we define a variable for the input pin by adding const int button pin to the top of the file. And then we initialize the pin as an input in the setup function by writing pin mode button pin input. And basically we're done in setup. And in the loop function down below, let's now query the button state by using the digital read command and by writing int button state equals digital read button pin. So with each loop cycle, we are querying the state of the button pin. And now we can use a simple if statement to trigger the LED into the blinking mode. And now let's arrange the code slightly to do this and write if button state equals low, then write the green pin to high, the red pin to low and wait for half a second. Then when the wait is over, write the green pin to low mode once again and the red pin to high mode or high state once again. And then wait for another half second. And that's basically all there is to this small piece of code here. And when we transfer this code to the Arduino, you can see that the LEDs are now switched off by default. And as soon as we press the button, they start blinking asynchronously, just as before, with the only difference that we can now trigger this behavior by pressing the button. And with this, we are ready to finish our traffic light project finally. 
And to do so, we first want to think about the different phases of the control loop. So as long as no one presses the button, the red LED should be switched on and the green LED should be switched off in default mode. And then once a pedestrian presses the button, the red LED should still be on for a short while, but the green LED should be blinking to indicate that it will soon change from red to green. And once it has finished blinking for a number of times, it, would, it should switch from red to green for several seconds to let the pedestrians pass the street. And once they're across, it should switch to its default state once again until the next pedestrian presses the button once more. So to implement this, we can define a variable which keeps track of the current state and which controls the behavior of the algorithm in the loop function. So let's now define a global variable called current state and we do this by writing int current state at the top and initialize it to zero in the setup function, which means we write current state equals zero. And then in the loop function, let's define the behavior for phase number zero by writing if current phase equals zero, then write the state of the green pin to low, write the state of the red pin to high. That's the default behavior, which is done every, which is executed every time when no one presses a button and the cycle of the traffic light is over. So by default, red is on and green is off. But now let's use the button to trigger a transition to the next phase, to phase number one. And to do this, we need to express in the code that once the button has been pressed, we want to proceed to phase number one. And we can do this by writing the following code. We need to capture the button state as before by writing int button state equals digital read button pin. And now we express in the if statement, if button state is identical to low and the current state is indeed zero, then we set the current state to one instead. And that's all we do at this point in time in this if statement here. So the idea of phase number one is to make the green LED blink for a number of times. There are several ways to do this, but we will use a global counter in this video to keep track of the number of blinking cycles, which we define at the top as flash counter, and it's of type integer. And to make sure it's always starting with zero, we need to initialize it when we transition from phase zero to phase one. So we add flash counter is zero directly after we set the current state to one. And now let's implement the phase one behavior. We can do this with another if statement again, which simply states that if current state is identical to one, then execute the code which is between the curly brackets. And inside of this block, we can use the code from the last video to implement the blinking behavior. So we simply write digital right, green pin, low, then wait for half a second, and then set the pin state to high again, and then wait for another half second. And now the green LED will blink in half second intervals. And to make it stop eventually, we need to keep track of the number of cycles, which we can simply do by increasing the flash counter after each cycle. So we add flash counter plus plus to the code in the block here. And to make sure we stop, we add another if condition at the end that sets the state to phase two once the counter has reached its maximum. So we write if flash counter is larger or equal to, let's say five, so we want to have it blink five times, then set the current state to two. And finally, let's implement phase number two, which turns off the red LED and lights up the green one permanently for some seconds. And to do this, we of course need another if clause just as before, and we simply write if current state equals two, then execute the code in the block between the curly brackets. And inside the block, we first switch on the green LED, turn off the red one, and then we wait for several seconds, and then we revert the state of the LED pins, which means we first set the red pin to low state, then we set the green pin to high state, then we wait for, let's say, four seconds, and then we revert the pin states to red pin high again, green pin now low, which turns the red one on and the green one off. And lastly, we change the state back to zero again, so a push of the button can restart the cycle once more. And now we are basically done with the coding part. So let's upload the sketch to the Arduino and conduct a short test. And as we can see, the initial behavior is to turn on the red LED and switch off the green, and this works fine. When we press the button once, you can see that the green LED starts to blink immediately. And once it has finished blinking five times, the red LED is turned off and the green one lights up permanently. And after a short while, four seconds, the circuit goes back to its default state, um, green is switched off and the red one lights up again. So I think we have finally passed the test and the code seems to be working just fine. And to use this kind of state transitions in a loop is a good way to have the Arduino perform several tasks seemingly at the same time, even though there is no real multitasking as with your smartphone processor, for example. And finally, let's briefly look at the difference between hardware pull-up 
and software pull-up resistors. In the circuit we have built so far, we have used an additional resistor to connect the button, which has the advantage that we do not need to consider the functionality of the button in the code design. But what we need to do is we need to physically place the button on the board, which could be a cost issue, which could also be a space issue. And in case you don't want to do this, for which reason whatsoever, there's another solution which is offered to you because the Arduino has a series of internal 20 kilo ohm pull-up resistors to use for its input pins, which can be activated from the code. And this is what we want to do now. So let's try this and remove the pull-up resistor from the board. And as you can see, the green LED starts blinking immediately once we plug out the resistor, which means that the traffic light cycle has been triggered because the button pin is now in an undefined state, which in this case is close to zero volts. And this does not happen only once after we pull out the resistor, but it happens over and over again. So if you connect the button directly to a pin and ground, you will get a stable low state, but no stable high state. And let's now go back to the code and change the input mode of the button to input pull up and just see what happens. And after we compile and transfer the code to the Arduino board, we can see that the red LED is switched on again. And when we press the button, a new cycle starts and the green LED starts blinking just as before. So which pull up method should you use in practice? In case space on the breadboard is limited, if costs are an issue, or if you simply do not have a 10K resistor lying around, in these cases, I recommend you use the software pull-up version. The problem, however, is that the electric functionality of the circuit, in this case, depends on you using the correct software commands. You have to actively remember to set the input pin to internal pull-up mode, and this is simply an additional source of error which people could make, which becomes even greater when you are developing in a team with others. So in case the three exceptions which I mentioned not apply to you, I recommend you use a physical pull-up resistor just as we did in the traffic light circuit. In this video you have learned what a pull-up resistor is and how it can be used to connect a push button to the Arduino. And also you have seen what happens if you do not use a pull-up resistor which causes an excessive current flow between the supply terminals. And finally we have completed the traffic light project by cycling through a series of software states that represent the different phases of the traffic light. And with this you are now able to build small Arduino circuits by yourself and also run simple programs on it. And in the upcoming videos we will slowly increase the complexity of the circuits by adding new components such as capacitors, transistors and also other circuits such as the 555 timer for example. So if you like this video here leave a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to my channel if you like. And also you can download the slides and schematics I use in my videos from my website at thefearlessengineer.com. The link is coming up now here in the banner. So thanks for watching, have fun and see you next time here on The Fearless Engineer.